What happens when we get stressed? We have vegan cupcakes. We go on a double date with Ben and Jerry. Uh, we go out and we, we indulge in these things, right? The vegan version, of course, but that's what happens. What, what do we do? Why is that? Why is it that we're drawn to this thing when we're stressed? Somehow, because stress is desserts spell backwards. It is indeed what we see in this. So the idea is that our stress can add to our resiliency or add to our stress. So our nutrition can add to our resiliency or add to our stressors. And so what do I mean by nutritional stress? Nutritional stress is not just what we don't do. It's not just eating the disease-forming foods. I like to call the health-promoting foods. I always kind of debate and I say, you know what, let's not worry about, let's not quibble over what we disagree with. Let's, let's agree that fruits, vegetables, whole grains, beans, legumes, nuts, and seeds are beneficial for your body. So it's not, just, it's, it's not just eating the disease-forming foods, it's also not eating the health-promoting foods. We tell folks what they can't do, and we leave a vacuum in, in place that then they don't know how to feel and, and the, what voids to kind of go from there. And so now, as a result, we've created these things called Fast Food Nation that Dr. Furman just spoke about, right? It's not just fast food on the outside, it's fast food on the inside that we're bringing into the home. It's not just what we get from a drive through line, it's also what we're buying in a store that's easily preparable in that instance. And so many of us think we have a choice. We say, well, just do better. You know better, do better, right? But the, the honest truth is that many people live in areas riddled with weapons of mass destruction. we have now living in crucibles of stress, right? Nutritional stress, life stressors that are there that are just boiling over waiting for disease to happen underneath. And so they're all comprised of three things as we all know well, salt, sugar, and, and fat are the things that they're comprised of, and they definitely lead to an addiction. And, and, and so we know, and many of you I'm sure have read, how many of you guys have read Michael Moss's book? It's good, so, you, so that's a great book. If you haven't read that book, read that book. It's several years old now, but that book, it goes into detail, talking really in, in depth about the health, the food industry of how they actually go ahead and they say, I want to look and see how people that look like you and like you and are your gender and your gender, how they will respond to salt, sugar, and fat. It goes into detail and says, well, how can we market so we can get the precise amount, that perfect bliss point that keeps you coming back for more? Because we don't like using words like addiction as it relates to, to food. We like using things like bliss point, that, that, that bet, you can't just, bet you can't eat just one, right? That's what we do. And, and so uh, the food we eat creates stress in our bodies. And so what we know in general is that even some of when we compare animal protein to plant protein, besides the fact that we know that there's an increased risk of death, increased risk of death as it relates to animal protein compared to plant-based proteins, we also know that there are some small studies that suggest our salivary cortisol levels are increased. That now we, we create this hormone that leads to the same effect by the foods that we eat that we know that by, by not eating health-promoting foods that are devoid of antioxidants, which stand in the way as a barrier to prevent disease, we're propagating disease. If the estimates show, I, be, I believe, one out of 10 Americans eat anywhere close to the servings that are recommended in terms of fruits and vegetables and whole grains. That's what the CDC reported from several years ago. So our, our use of antioxidants has plummeted exponentially. When we look in general, as we spoke about earlier, this thing called advanced glycated end products, uh, this excessive grilling that occurs. It's kind of like, uh, I learned how to cook years ago, and so they call it like roux, when you kind of brown the gravy, you brown the flour, and you create this gravy and all this other stuff. That browning effect, whether or not it's toast or whatever it may be, that's the same thing that happens on the inside of your vessels that leads to destruction and so forth. We know excessive grilling at high temperatures, it can lead to the same effects as far as elevated blood pressure and cardiovascular events, this thing called advanced glycated end products. We spoke about fast food, but what does fast food really do? A study at the University of Minnesota showed that eating fast food once per week increases your risk of heart attacks by 20%. How about two or three times per week? Oh, well, that gets you up to about 50%. How about greater than four times per week? Increases your risk of heart attacks by 80%. Our decisions play a significant role in what happens with us. We know about TMAO. We've heard multiple instances about the, the microbiome and the contribution, and, and Dr. Ornish said eloquently in terms of just the relationship as you move across the dietary patterns with the level of TMAO that's there. These things, we're finding more and more information that explains and fills the gap, that void of, of questions of why we're seeing the increased disease burden that's there. What about, what about this thing called sugar? We all love sugar. 
I'm a recovering sugar holic, I will say first and foremost. And so what studies have shown several years ago out of JAMA is the fact there's an increased risk, increased risk of cardiovascular events with the increased added consumption of sugar of 20% or more is what we're seeing. But not only that, the sugar actually uh, can impact the endothelium. Oh, actually, I have a different slide. So the sugar actually impacts the endothelium, so our flow-mediated dilatation actually is reduced with sugar consumption. The same thing as mental stress, the same thing as animal products, that with the increased amounts of sugar, our flow-mediated dilatation is decreased. When we look at the thing at salt, too, as well, same thing. Dr. Furman just alluded to it. It impacts the flow-mediated dilatation. The ability of the artery, the vessels to dilate, becomes impacted. It no longer is able to dilate and be functional. So what does that mean practically? If the vessels can't dilate and they're stiff, what do you think is going to happen as blood is coursing through those vessels? The blood pressure is going to rise. Blood pre the pressure will rise because it becomes a rigid structure. So we see that happen uh, periodically. So as a result of all these things called nutritional stress, the world is suffering. The world is suffering. I just got back from Korea, and what did I observe in Korea? That it's fast food nation. I saw all sorts of fried chicken, burger places, all around. Even at their baseball game, guess what they serve? Fried chicken, not hot dogs, fried chicken. We have become experts in, in exportation of our goods. The standard American diet, as well as our Western disease, and as a result, the world is suffering. What we're seeing is that 71% of global disease is due to non-communicable diseases, right? In the cath lab, they love to joke with me and say, Doc, if you get sick, I'm going to laugh at you. I said, well, it's not about communicable diseases. I can catch a cold or a flu. I'm, just because I haven't had one doesn't mean I can't. It's about the occurrence of diabetes. It's the occurrence of high blood pressure, of stroke. If I'm able to prevent that, that's really the goal. And so we're seeing this direct association that's there. We're seeing that this rise in this tackle on of Non-communicable diseases is indeed related to about four things. Our food, sits disease, not moving, our alcohol consumption, and as far as our smoking. And where are the main things as a result? 50% are from cardiovascular disease, but we know 80% comprise multiple things that are just fairly typical. Diabetes, cancer, heart disease, and respiratory dysfunction. That's there. In the U.S., we know basically 60% have at least one chronic disease diagnosed, right? Two uh, of the, uh, uh, four, excuse me, 40% have two or more diseases. Significant. Multiple pills, poly pills. I hadn't read this, but someone was mentioning to me about the fact that there's a new triple loaded pill. It has three medications in one. Let's make it easier. Three medications in one. That's there. But the key is it's really never too late to change the direction that we're going in. That's the key. As, as a society, we have to engage in a degree of spiritual, emotional, physical, and nutritional resiliency. We need to change the game and change the way in which we approach the care of ourselves and the care of our patients. When we do that, we can alter this course of the disease state, disease burden that, that, that exists. And so one of the things that we know is the fact that when we change our hearts, when we change our minds, and we begin the process of loading it with fruits and vegetables and whole grains that also release serotonin, that also release the dopamine too as well, they last longer and we have it on a repeated basis, that moods can shift and they can change too as well. We have to have a change in mind. I remember I, I didn't always eat this way and so I never forget, even before I, I ventured into whole food plant-based, I remember going grocery shopping. And when you have kids, things start to change a little bit. I remember going down grocery store lines and when I was in med school, I would buy a box of whatever you, kind of junk food cereal you want to call out, right? Because I was a junk food vegetarian. I wasn't, uh, I wasn't animal, I didn't eat animal products, but I ate tons of junk food. And so I would buy, I would buy this big box of cereal. I poured in a big bowl and I put my, my non-milk in there and I would just eat up, somehow thinking I'm healthier than everyone else. I would then go and get my donuts and I would get my coffee and, and I was good to go. And so what I realized having kids was that I was almost inclined to go and purchase some of those things because I said, oh man, I bet you they're going to love this. They're going to love the way this tastes, and I want to make them happy, so I want to give them the things that I think are going to make them happy. And even before I got to this point, I remember stopping myself and saying, why are you doing that? Why are you giving your kids this stuff that's not ideal for them? And so I made myself not do it. And so that's the concept. We have to have a change in mind in our approach to things on a day-in and day-out basis and be open enough to, to have that conversation with patients. And so lovely study done by Dr. Bernard and so forth, looking at the impact of changing one's diet in this approach. 
and the group from Geico and saying, we can make a change. And they're diabetics and obese and looking to see, but here was the catch. Their emotional well-being, their productivity at work seemed to improve in part because of the food, but also in part because of social support. That social support is so important. And so when we look across the board, the benefits of nutrition and improving the markers of inflammation, the benefits of nutrition and improving low media dilatation, when they compare individuals on a plant-based diet compared to a standard diet, showing the benefits that's there. Showing the benefits too as well that once starting on this process of increasing uh, the plant-rich sources, low media, media dilatation improved astronomically showing the benefits that were there compared to standard care. What's key too as well is that when we looked in general with flow media dilatation is the fact that just by walking, that there was a benefit, just by walking. Now when you add walking plus meditation, that you just have time in silence to kind of think and ponder, that your body's ability to relax, the opening and the awareness of prefrontal cortex improves astronomically that when we change our mood and our mood improves from being stressed out and frustrated to taking a moment to relax, to relax and rejuvenate, that we see that now all of a sudden our, our vessels begin to dilate much easier. That when we looked at yoga, they took three groups of yoga participants. They took those who are older, those who are middle-aged, and those who are young. And what they found in those who are middle-aged and older is that it dramatically improved their dilatation of their vessels by just engaging in the yoga. You know, when you do the yoga and when you do the deep breathing, you know that when you breathe out, the parasympathetic tone is improved, right? That helps offset some of the sympathetic rise that's there, and that's where the benefits uh, comes in. You know, one of the things to 